Uh, greetings once again. Uh, these are some informal remarks uh, of the kind that we usually have when we have a discussion together where uh, you can ask questions, make comments. Um, but let me uh, address you for just a, a few minutes uh, on a subject that may uh, inspire you to have a co further conversation among yourselves. Uh, you've received a rule of law bookmark, uh, which um, we sent to you. Uh, the origins of this uh, date back, oh, some 20 years when I was on one of my short teaching visits to China. We were at a university and my best recollection is that it was Renmin University. And uh, of course, like many judges, uh, my beginning was somewhat pompous, uh, saying, I'm here to tell you about the rule of law. Um, and one student raised his or her hand and there were probably five or 600 students in the room and said, what does the rule of law mean? And it never occurred to me to define it. And so my answer uh, was that it's in three parts. And later, uh, the United Nations asked me to write it down, uh, which we did. And it's been translated into many different languages. Uh, that should not keep you from telling me in later correspondence, if you choose, that it's incomplete or unclear or that it should be supplemented. Uh, we wanted, to, to, wanted it to be short uh, so that we could think about the rule of law and as you know, it's been translated into many different languages, uh, which we hope you have at, at your conference. Um, the first uh, precept, uh, and there are three parts. The first one is, is, that the, the, is that the law is superior to the government, and the government is bound by the law. And this means officials at the lowest level, uh, who, who, must, who must obey the law. Uh, the law shouldn't be secret. Um, now you might say, well, what if the law is unjust? Uh, Stalin killed millions of people. Uh, what, what if he said, well, uh, this is the law as I gave it. Mussolini made the trains run on time. Um, but that's not the law as we do know it or as we ought to know it. And a government that uses law as a monopoly to direct its citizens' lives can be terrifying. Uh, so the first paragraph, in effect, asks uh, us to read further and indicate what should the law say. And that brings us to the, to the second paragraph. Uh, and a key part of it is that the law must respect the dignity of persons. Uh, of all persons. To, to begin with, that's the, uh, an essential cornerstone uh, for us to have a conversation with, with, with each other. Uh, you know, 
Americans talk often about the Constitution. And we think of the Constitution with a capital C. Uh, a capital C to indicate we're talking about the Constitution that was drawn in Philadelphia in 1787 and enacted in 1789. The Constitution that defines us as a people. You can't talk to an American lawyer for very long or an American citizen, we hope, without hearing about the Constitution. It defines us as a people. Uh, and it does preserve uh, what we seek to express in paragraph two, the dignity of all persons. Now, writings about the dignity of all persons are, are nothing new. Mencius, who was uh, a Confucius uh, uh, student, uh, wrote thousands of years ago. Um, you've heard me say before at your conference, uh, perhaps in, in New York, uh, that Mencius has the same relation to Confucius as Plato did to Socrates. You wouldn't have heard much about Confucius or nearly as much if it weren't for Mencius. You wouldn't have heard about uh, Socrates or nearly as much if it hadn't been for Plato. But in any event, uh, Mencius centuries ago uh, gave this question pose this problem. A stranger from a distant part of the nation is walking through the countryside and goes by uh, a farmhouse. Uh, it has a well, a water well. And he sees a little child crawling up the wall of the well and ready to fall in. Does he have a duty to run and rescue that child? Uh, this writing shows that in ancient China, there was a recognition that each person has a morality, a moral sense, a moral decency of his own, of her own. Uh, and that is what we try uh, to, to capture in, 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 paragraph, in paragraph two. Um, the dignity of persons is essential to the rule of law. Now, jo John Locke explained that you can't have a civic dialogue unless you respect the voice and the personhood and the natural rights of your fellow citizens. In the American and, and Anglo uh, legal tradition, uh, the Magna Carta is of tremendous importance. It was in the year 1215. Before then, most every legal documents, and there were some wonderful constitutions, were written in a way that the state gave the persons certain rights. Magna Carta said, no, 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 no. Persons already have rights. It's persons who give the directions to the government, not the other way around. That's the meaning of Magna Carta. And this bookmark uh, seeks to reflect that. The last, and, and, and we could go on and on about the, the meaning of, of dignity and, and, and what law must, and what law must, must mean. It doesn't mean that Stalin can kill thousands, millions of people because there's a human dignity there. Um, then we say that uh, the law must be accessible. Uh, my Paul clerk is here listening to us. One 
uh, great prerogative of members of the judiciary, the federal judiciary in the United States is that we have wonderful young people working with us for a year as, as our law clerks. Um, and he made the comment to me that lawyers are, are ambassadors to the law. And it seemed to me that this is a very apt description of the purpose and function and, and duty and aspirations for lawyers who meet with their clients. Uh, they are ambassadors to the law. Uh, Javier Cremades, uh, by his leadership of this great Congress, is a, is a splendid example of this. Uh, thank you again, Javier, for making uh, this association and its dialogues and its meetings uh, so accessible to all of us, accessible to each other. Uh, there, there's a book uh, on the, the, the law of, of the American American legal history, of American legal history. Uh, it's in its fifth edition now by, by Kermit Hall, American Legal History. And if any of you are interested, it, it looks like a great big, and it is a great big long book. Uh, it looks like a great big long book, and it is. But it dates from the Middle Ages and goes through modern times. This is in the fifth edition uh, by Kermit Hall. And they're very short um, uh, sections and paragraphs uh, summarizing uh, so much of what our legal history is. And one of the quotations he has is from a writer who said, we must not be deaf to the voice of justice. And one of the reasons that you meet here, huh? One of the reasons that so many of us are proud of your association and value it so highly is uh, that you know we must not be deaf to the voice of justice. Do we know what justice means? Not altogether. Um, this is an, 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 an adventure and ascent, as I've said before. Uh, an avenue, a path uh, that we find together over time. Uh, it is sometimes difficult to see injustice in your own times. Uh, but that is what the law is designed to counter. And that is what your association uh, has as one of its great purposes. So once again, uh, we, we wish you well, and please be assured of the high respect that so many of us have for you, for who you are, and for what you do uh, to preserve the rule of law. We meet here as friends, you meet here as friends, and we hope that friendship becomes even closer over time and we hope that between uh, this Congress and your meeting in the Dominican Republic, we can talk often about how the association might better bring the idea of justice and the rule of law to every nation. Best wishes and thank you very much.